maybe going bi-weekly or, or a little break here and there? Yeah, I think that we are learning. I think that these therapies are still very early compared to some of the other drugs we have experience with. I know that in the case of teclistamab in particular, there is some data to suggest that for patients who have achieved a very deep disease response, the dosing can be spread out further. I would love to be able to tell a patient that I have a test that I can do on their marrow or on their blood that says, this is how much BCMA expression you have right now. This is how much you need for this drug to work. But I don't, I don't have that available at this point. What else? Would MRT testing be kind of a good test to do to kind of help determine or help a patient make that decision along with the doctor to see you? I think it has the potential. I think that in myeloma, MRD testing, I could just sit down. In myeloma, MRD testing is still something that we're learning to use. So does everybody know what that refers to as far as, yes? So, it's, so MRD is um, an acronym or a, an abbreviation for minimal residual disease. And there are newer technologic methods of taking a bone marrow sample and figuring out just how much myeloma is still in that sample. So um, improving upon the pathologist's capability to look at the slide and count cells with their eyes. They're able to take the genetic material from a patient's initial bone marrow biopsy, use that as a kind of signpost, and then look for those signposts, even if they're present in very, very low levels, in a sample later on. So we know that it is good to have less disease. It's good to be MRD negative. It's good to stay MRD negative. We don't know when it's important to achieve that MRD negativity, is it better to get there really fast or is it just as good if you eventually make it down there? We don't know how long someone can be considered MRD negative to be able to start using the cure word. Like, wouldn't it be cool if we could say that MRD negativity for this many years equals cure in myeloma? We don't, we don't know that yet. We also don't know how much residual disease counts, if that makes sense. So if you achieve MRD negativity, that right now means that in a sample that's taken, there is no myeloma cell detectable at a sensitivity down to 10 to the minus five, according to FDA rules, according to the rules for the company that does a lot of the MRD testing, they can go down to 10 to the minus six so that's one in a million or one in 10 million. So if you get down to that level, that's great. But what if you're down to that level and you then start to pop back up again and you're at 11 cells or 15 cells? When do you say that the disease is coming back? That part's really hard. So, so my answer is yes and no, yes. I think it could be useful to use MRD testing in that manner, but we don't have enough data yet to say when the switch actually is going to become a critical switch that will make you change your treatment decision. Do you think it's something everyone should have done? Or is it an option? Or? I think it depends. Um, the question of is it an option is, is an interesting one. There's two main ways to do MRD testing. One of them is with something called next generation sequencing where they're doing um, procedures in the lab where they're looking for that specific genetic um, marker for that individual's myeloma cells. There are some patients whose myeloma cells do not have what's called a trackable sequence to them. So what, what happens is um, I have a patient that I'm seeing, I'm gonna order a bone marrow biopsy. I know that I want to get MRD testing for them. I ask my team to work with the company that does this test and they can get a hold of the original diagnostic bone marrow biopsy that was done at some point, maybe five years ago or something like that. They send that to the lab, which is in Seattle, and they look at that sample and they say, are there trackable sequences that are present in this patient's mm -hmm. sample from the past? Can we use those trackable sequences on this future sample? So some people don't have a trackable sequence and that's just the way their myeloma mm -hmm. is. The other way that the MRD is sometimes done is with um, a specialized type of flow cytometry. And that's done in 
um, specific centers. So some areas of the country can do it. Some of them don't have the same capabilities of doing it. So it can be done for many patients. Do you have to have it done? I think it's becoming more important, but, but as I mentioned, we don't yet know how to use the tools as well as I think we're going to know in the next few years. Can I ask two questions on the yeah. Sure. So one is, um, like when you get your lab result, you just go in for your regular blood draw and you get your lab results and it will say, and they're doing, they look at your light chains and they look at your M spike. And for your M spike, it will say, um, at some point you hope it will say, no previously identified monoclonal antibody is present. Mm -hmm. At that point, I would think that possibly somebody might want to do an MRD test, but if it's present, then you know you're not MRD negative. Right. Well, it's yes and no, okay. again. Um, so the MRD test is done on the bone marrow sample. So as you might be aware, there are patients who have myeloma that's active outside of the bone marrow space. So people who have plasma cytomas or they have disease that has come out of the marrow space in association with bone lesions. Mm -hmm. And it's possible that you could be MRD negative in the bone marrow, mm -hmm. but still have active myeloma somewhere else in the body. Mm -hmm. So that could be a condition where if you have a plasma cytoma that is producing myeloma protein that can be measured, that you would have a measurable light chain mm -hmm. abnormality or an M protein, but still have no evidence of disease in the marrow. So that's something to just, just kind of keep in mind. Clear, is no, okay, so that's... So my other question is, so I was always secreting until, my, 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 my myeloma was secreting until about a year and a half ago, and all of a sudden, um, Dr. Cowan told me that it wasn't secreting because of some testing that I had. And then um, I changed my medicine, and it would say that you know, so it was, uh, they could see it, and then it would say not previously identified. And then I had the PET uh, MRI, mm -hmm. and I had the colonial sequencing for the MRI, and everything looks clear. So then I asked myself, am I really not secreting, or was it just not showing up because I'm MRD negative? It's hard to know. Okay. It, it's hard to know when the disease changes over okay. over time, which I think people unfortunately have to have to live with. Um, becoming non-secretory is something that often happens after someone has had initial treatment, and you know, as you get to later lines, there are some people who are non-secretory from the beginning, which can be which can be another wrinkle into how how we manage things. In um, newly diagnosed, are you now always doing clones? Um, just at base, so you have that baseline already. Um, yeah, I, now that now it's I, I'm I'm not, um, and the main reason is because I've had a good experience with the company that does the procedure, being able to get the archive specimens, oh, okay. and so it's it's been fine. So it's it's just like one extra layer of complexity on the set of bone marrow orders that I'd rather not trouble people with, if, if you will, because I know that we can usually get the archive specimen and test it from there. Um, I do think about it a lot, a lot more with the newly diagnosed patients who are going through their initial induction, because we're starting to use it, at least I'm starting to ask for it more, when we're checking that marrow to decide if it's time to go on to transplant. Because if someone is MRD negative at that point, and maybe they're on the fence about if they want to go on to transplant, that's another conversation about, you know, what is that going to be adding, and what do we know about about the state of the disease at this point? So I know that some of you, at least, oh yeah, go ahead. I don't know. I don't know. I think um, I think that a lot of us were super hopeful that CAR T was gonna gonna be a cure, and it's it's a tool, right? It, it's a tool that we're learning how to use, and we're learning the the best time to use it, and realizing that that best time might be different for different people. Um, I think it's. I think our, our, our current structure for how we use transplant with the idea that we want to get a patient their 
best possible response and then hold them at that best response for as long as we can, that all still holds, that all makes sense. And we're going to be learning whether CAR T is just as good as transplant at, at achieving that best response. I don't think we're gonna know the real answer to that question for years. Those studies that are starting to look at randomizing between CAR and auto for newly diagnosed patients, there's a whole bunch of them coming down the road and we're gonna see what they, what they have to show. Mm -hmm. Can you have a stem cell transplant after you've had a car? Yes. Yes. Can you have more than one car? That, I think we are going to see it, but I don't know exactly when. So I know there was mention about how there are different targets to CAR T that are being developed. Um, I was, I was, uh, sending an email about one of my, my patients to a bunch of colleagues all, all around the country earlier this week. This patient has had myeloma for a while, has had many, many lines of therapy, has relapsed off of BCMA CAR. Then we gave him talcatamab, so that GPRC51D by specific antibody. So two cell-directed therapies in a row. Now disease is active again. And so the question that I sent to my colleagues was, A, do you think it's smart or not smart to try to give another cellular type immune therapy again, a third in a row, like are the rest of his cells going to be able to do it? And then my second question was, should we still be considering using this BCMA target because it's just been a few months since the, the CAR-T exposure or should we be trying to do something completely different? And so we went with, we went with trying to avoid doing the same cellular therapy type mechanism work, trying a different target and you know we don't know is the truth we're just trying to make decisions that make sense for the the person in front of us please um so my partner kathy had uh, compression fractures and um, that led to the initial diagnosis and uh, had induction therapy stem cell transplant now it's been two and a quarter years since the stem cell transplant but it hasn't had any scans or MRIs to look back or compare with the baseline of the compression fractures and the, um, the uh, um, genetic lesion that was found. Should she be getting regular scans? It's a little, it's a little unclear, actually. I know Dr. Banerjee mentioned that he does sometimes do that on an annual basis for patients. I do it for some patients who have had really profound bone disease, like lots and lots of, of lytic lesions, particularly for patients who are living with a fair amount of chronic pain, because it can be really hard for an individual to know if something's different about their pain when they've been living with it for, for a long period of time. The other reason that I think it does sometimes make sense to look again is if you were to get a scan like a PET scan, which shows you something in addition to the architecture of the skeleton, the PET, probably you guys know this, the PET adds the layer of showing us which tissues in the body are very metabolically active. And so some of those are expected to be really metabolically active, like your, your brain, but some of them you would see brightness in an area of active disease, like in an area of your skeleton. And that can be useful to use if the labs seem like they are no longer readable, if, if someone perhaps is becoming non-secretory, or if there's a change in the labs, you don't know whether it's an important change or, or a not important change. Do you think some HMOs just have their certain menu of yes. scans? And do they absolutely do. They absolutely do. So, so when, I know you mentioned that you guys were at, at OHSU. OHSU's- um, Kaiser. Okay, but, but the OHSU process for scheduling imaging, I, I, I warn all of my patients about this because it's frustrating for them. We schedule the scan, they get the date for the scan on the calendar, and the current world is that the insurance communicating office, the, the office that gets the authorization for the scan, they work based on when that appointment is set so they were 
it seems so silly to me. They work like starting 72 hours before the scheduled appointment to ask the insurance company for the authorization. And as far as I can tell, the only thing it does is cause anxiety for <laughs> for all of the patients, their family members. They'll be like, what are you talking about? We scheduled this six weeks ago. And it's just very hard for people to understand that that is the workflow and that's the cue that was put together. So I get the opportunity to talk to lots of insurance companies you know, within a relatively short period of time of when the scan is planned. And I, I generally, I, I can sometimes like talk them into things that they don't want to do. But even if I can't, I try to ask them what would be approved because I'm trying to just get an understanding of what is considered acceptable right now. And um, the whole body CTs seem to now be on the list of what is approved for many of the different payers. The whole body MRIs are increasingly also on that list. There's some specifics about how it has to be ordered so that the intention is understandable to the insurance company. Kaiser, as you guys know, is a whole nother, whole nother world as far as getting those approvals set through. So it may be that your, your team is working through that framework and trying yeah. to figure it out that way. Yes, please. How often do you do bone marrow biopsies? So that, I, I, I know Dr. Cowan mentioned um, the difference between transplant doctors and non-transplant doctors. Um, I'm a non-transplant doctor, so I don't do them as often as the transplant doctors do. So for patients who are secretory, where I think I have a measurable protein, I'll do a bone marrow biopsy when it's gonna change what I'm gonna do. If I'm pretty sure that someone's disease has become active again and that we've got to make a change in therapy, I don't know that we need to do a bone marrow biopsy for the sake of the test. Um, but if I really wanna know is something different about a patient's characteristics, if I'm curious, if I'm underestimating or overestimating their disease burden based on what the labs are showing, then I might do it. And um, I, I also don't tend to get the surveillance bone marrow biopsies on, on anniversaries. I know that some, some people really do feel strongly about doing the like one year, two year, three year bone marrow biopsies following, following transplant, but I don't know that that's universal. So are most of you working with community teams as well as academic teams or how did, how did you guys find out about this? Because <laughs> it's great. It's I've never been to one of these before. It's a really good one. What do you mean by community teams versus academic? Well, like I, I know a fair bunch of you come, go to the Hutch. I didn't know if you, you know, go to the Hutch as your primary place that you go, or whether you go there as your check-ins every few months. I'm with the prime. Well, there's the private group. Uh huh. I don't know. I'm not involved with the university at all. Uh huh. Are some of you in a in a world where you're being co-managed, where you go to the academic center and you also have a, a community doctor who's making some of the game day decisions about? Um, what we've found with Kaiser is very little, um, you know, uh, reaching out to the patient. That this is what's available to you. It's been through our own research of different organizations and finding choices getting on um, going attending webinars online okay but uh, it's been disappointing Kaiser they have not reached out to say this is what available is available for you um, because through our local support groups we just didn't know about so just last year or so and um, so it just it's sort of hit or miss on our own research okay I I asked because my my team, so the nurse coordinator that I work with and the medical assistant who helps me do all of my work, we've started revising the packet that we are giving out to all of our, our newly referred patients. And we've been talking about what we think is the most important information to in include in there. And so, um, you know, we always give a list of, 
um, reference sites that we think are, are reasonable for people to go to because we want, I think it's impossible to tell people not to research their disease and so it'd be better to just say, you know, start with these places where there's good, well-vetted information. So we always give that kind of information. We give some information about general, you know, how the academic medical center is structured so people can understand when they call on the phone, where's their phone call going and who are they gonna be talking to? We try to give a little bit of information about financial assistance programs, but I guess I just haven't been clear how, how, how do people normally find out about those sorts of things? Like there's a lot of resources through the LLS and through other charitable organizations. People find it just by happenstance or they go looking on their own or? Happenstance. Well, I know for us we didn't, okay. yeah, on our own. Because we didn't even have even information from Medicare for us about poultry. You usually learn about it a couple years ago by Google. Okay. Yeah, okay. that's how I did it. I just Googled it. I chose Prefetch and Evergreen. Uh -huh. And I was actually telling a couple of the nurses when I went in for my injection, they didn't even know about poultry. Okay. They, okay. They and they said, well, what is that? And I said, that's the best thing ever. <laughs> you know? Yeah. They, 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 so they, some of the staff, they don't even, aren't aware of this. Yeah, I mean, I think the myeloma community is really, really remarkable because there's a lot of different organizations, and Health Tree is one of them, that provide a lot of really high quality information to, to patients and caregivers, and they're, they're very open about wanting people to talk to each other and wanting people to feel comfortable asking questions and, and learning what's, what's available. How much do you guys talk about Money with your healthcare teams. I've been very lucky to have. I haven't talked to them about money at all. They've just found grants. They found this. Mm -hmm. They've said, "Okay, here's what your bill's going to be this month." And That's great. They've been very reasonable. And uh, did they know that you would? be someone who would appreciate a grant, or do they just presume that anyone would appreciate a grant? Uh, when you talk about Rebel Mid, they assume anybody would appreciate your grant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, that's, and I, had, I actually ended up with one grant for Rebel Mid and another grant for some of my other drugs. Yeah. But I didn't do anything. Yeah, because I mean, it's getting to be that time of year where the, the MA that, that helps me, who's, I mean, he's an angel. He starts sending out the messages around now saying, dear patient, you have this grant and this grant. I am working on the renewals. And part of that is him wanting to do it so that they don't start the process and muck it up for him and make it, make it more <laughs> difficult. I'm sorry, where, where, do you, where are you treated? Hmm? Where are you treated? Uh, in Olympia. Okay, I was just curious, because at the Hutch, I know when you first go there, they set you up with, you know, a pharmacist and a social worker, and a social worker will sit down with you and talk about what options mm -hmm. that get, and connect you to resources. Beyond that, I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. What else they do? But in terms of letting people know about things, so here in, in Seattle, some of you may know there's something called the Myeloma Fighters, and that's just a group of people that. Uh, get together monthly, and um, now it's all on Zoom. We have speakers every month, and they're always someone that's um, medical, like a lot of people from the medical community here. But one of the things that they've done is they ask members who don't get treated at the Hutch, that are treated in their communities, to send the names of their doctors, and then they have a flyer that they send out to the doctors to say the myeloma group exists if people want to do it, and that could be something that Health Tree, yeah, that's something lovely. Like that would be a way for Health Tree to get the word out to more people, and because they've done that at you know Swedish and Hutch, those doctors know to tell people about mm -hmm. the myeloma fighters, but they may not know about Health Tree. No, that's a really good suggestion. That's a great point. I live in Washington. I live in New Jersey. And I think it's where you get treated. Yeah. You get treated in the community. You may not know about the resources that are available to you as if you're getting treated in a specialist center. And I find that since I get consultations 
I can be a parent, but I get treated in the community. I'm in that little area where you kind of just give me everything because I'm not being treated there. So I don't usually see the social worker or the nutritionist or anything unless I request. Like if I was a patient of theirs, I think I would have more of those services automatically given to me. And in the community setting, setting there's not even a social worker. They, they don't know, and when you're talking about myeloma, it's just a small sliver of their practice that they may not even be aware of things that would be helpful to them. Yeah, I, I think that's actually very common, and I, I think it's just part of the reality of, of how healthcare is structured right now. There's just a lot of staffing shortages, <coughs> and there's a lot of turnover, and it's very hard, I think, for patients and their caregivers to try to know who their primary points of contact are. Um, I, I do think that's another one of the great benefits of this kind of, of organization that you can, it sounds like you can kind of message people in, in various groups and to just get a gut check is, does this make sense, what's happening, or, or should I be trying to get more information in some other kind of, kind of forum or some other kind of setting? And I know Health Tree is actively like going to like taking regions at a time and just sending our materials to those community practices, you know, just to, so that we can put things in people's hands. Yep. Because once you have something and you see what it provides you, all you need is that one initial point and then you can find so much more. Yeah. How, how much do you guys look into clinical trials? Do you independently look, or do you wait for someone to bring it up to you, or how has that been? Another good question I was going to ask you. Oh, sure. Um, so we don't get a lot of information from clinical trials. Um, the rheumatologist, mm -hmm. you know, when we talk to her, she, no, no, there's nothing really available. But I'm wondering, since we're the close to OHSU, and there must be some clinical trials going on there. How, how do we find out? Of what might be more uh, applicable to specific patients. So Kaiser's really, it's a, it's a closed system. It's a difficult financial system to work within. Um, I I can give you a couple different perspectives. The the doctor perspective is that we email each other and we know who each other are. And if one of the Kaiser docs has questions and is curious about a trial, then they email us. And we have absolutely enrolled some Kaiser patients on to clinical trials at, at OHSU. It takes, you know, another level of massaging the system to make it possible, but it can usually be done. And I, what I think has to happen is that the Kaiser team has to agree that this is a treatment that's different, that makes sense and is appropriate for this, this patient, and they can kind of be let, let out. Um, the the patient side of it though is is hard. So you mentioned that you'd had transplant at OHSU a couple couple years ago. There are some trials in the post transplant setting where um, we as physicians are are often wondering whether our Kaiser transplant patients could be eligible for them. And and for example, we have one that that we've just opened last week, which is doing post-transplant consolidation therapy in patients who are MRD positive after, after the procedure, so doing set amounts of novel therapies to try to convert those patients to MRD negativity. And it feels like it would be a great opportunity for Kaiser patients who might want to, to participate in that. And we're beginning the legwork to try to figure out how we can connect with the Kaiser, Kaiser team so for those of you who, I don't know how it's set up in, in Seattle. In Portland, if a patient is receiving their myeloma treatment through Kaiser, the contract that Kaiser has for transplant is with OHSU. So the patients see an OHSU transplant physician, they become an OHSU patient until day 90 That's after true. transplant? 30. 30 maybe. For, for a chunk of time, like through the transplant period and then afterwards, and then you kind of get a return to Kaiser packet is my, is my understanding of how things go. Yeah, and I think it's similar for CAR-T at this point. I'm not, I'm not sure of the time, 
time windows there. I have another question. Um, I think it's you know really important to get such opinions, and I, I did ask the uh, hematologist about that. She goes, "Oh, I really to totally agree." But like, I wanted to ask Dana Farber. Kept saying, "Oh, ask us any question." Well, when I'm there, they wanted twenty five hundred dollars for me to ask a question, and I thought, uh, I don't think I want to spend that much money. So we happen to have uh, Rob's niece, whose husband knows somebody who works at Speed of Hope sure. down in LA. Well, through the emails we got that, I got my answer, no cost. But what is a protocol to go? Is is the fee of that? Sort from Dana Farber is that would be normal? I mean, because well, I, you know, so Kaiser I doesn't have a, I know our physician is not um, my uh, multiple myeloma specialist. Yeah, I, I've seen that some of the second opinions from Dana Farber come in kind of two styles. There's the, the opinion that people seem to get, which I think is entirely based on record review. And then what comes back is like a essay. It's, it's nice, but it's like a report on how they are reading the patient's history and data and recommendations based on that. So that, I think, might be the fee-based one. I'm not, I'm not positive. The other kind is when you would go and present yourself to the clinic that you wanted to be seen in, and you would get, I believe, an insurance paid for second opinion. So yeah, Kaiser's, Ka different. Kaiser's different. Yeah. Kaiser's different, but outside of Kaiser, it can be, it can be something that's arranged. So at City of Hope, they actually have a Kaiser kind of center that they do bone marrow transplant and CAR-T with the Kaiser patients. So that's maybe another reason why it was easier to get information back from them. And well, they it sounds like you like might have gone moment. through the unofficial yeah. channels. Yeah, like would, you just no, did, you did family our, back channels. No, nobody knew. I just said, we have a plan and I can't. I, I want a second opinion. Sure. And it was about the breath one man. Uh, going down to five milligrams because of neutropenia, and I wanted to hear what do you think because I'm doing better. Why can't we go back up to ten if that's the dose? Um, but the question, the bottom line was, stay on five. If you're doing fine, don't go back up to the ten. Sure. And I said, okay, well I'll go with that. And that's what I've done. Yeah. So, but no, they didn't know I was a Kaiser patient. We didn't share that, but. They were very liberal in their thoughts of, you know, asking if you have anything else, get back with us. And I just thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm in the positive response. I don't call it, I don't call it so much that we're in a, a non-stay here. I just call it positive response for two years. But, you know, maybe it's going to be coming down the road to prepare ourselves. What are we going to do then? Because I know Kaiser's going to be sitting there going. Okay, here's our standard procedure for what you're going through based on your labs. And it's like, okay, I want another opinion or maybe a third opinion. And it's like, sort of freaks me out a little bit of going, am I gonna have to go through the same thing? Or who can I go to that really has special? And you know, I find out you're at OHSU. Yeah. I mean, we've already dealt with Dr. Mazaraz, who's <laughs> a character. And, uh, and then Fred, Fred Hutch uh, yeah. Medical Center. It gets real great reviews too, and these seem like good options. And then the other piece is that many of us chat with each other, and and we just send messages uh -huh. around, and we gather opinions, and we don't know the answer because okay. medicine, there's often not a right answer and a wrong okay. answer. It's just different shades yes. of, of of the color, and trying to figure out what's best for this person based on what might be available to them is is sometimes Well, I think that's what clear. we're gathering from going to different conferences and webinars is that the one answer is not absolute. There's some real gray areas and it's like, well, why don't we try this or do this and whatever. And I think I, you know, working with Kaiser, they're workable. It's not like they're just putting up a wall and saying no, but they don't always give me the answer I want to hear, I guess. Yeah, yep, <laughs> so, yep. So anyways, I, I appreciate hearing the communication from maybe OHSU with Fred Hutch and stuff yep. on the West Coast. But, you know, just when you're going, oh, I know our physician is not a multiple myeloma specialist. And it just 
sort of like, is she reading up on everything? So I sort of quiz her every three months. And I'd say, are you aware of this? And she's sort of looking at me. Because we only do um, videos. I only see her every three months. And it's fine with us. But she, I think she sort of realizes that we're up to date a little bit more than the average patient just because we're supporting each other and really trying to get what's out there. Yeah. If I didn't even know anything, my background is nursing. I had no idea what multiple myeloma was two and a half years ago. This is amazing about yeah. the support for this condition. I think it's incredible in, in a good way. Like, I, yes, I think it's really, yes. really good. You know, one of the things you were trans, so you were in the new building at OHS, yes. you came down at the waterfront. Yes, if you yes. believe it, one of the biggest complaints that I hear from patients that I've taken care of for a while is that even though the building is pretty and modern, it's too broken up. And they miss actually being able to sit in the waiting room with a bunch of other people and get to know each other. And you know, we used to, we used to be um, on top of the hill near, near where the main hospital was in this very historic building that will collapse when the when the earthquake comes. <laughs> <laughs> the infusion center was one open room which had basically armchairs around around the edges of it and people actually really miss that they got to make friends with with each other and they would realize that they were on a similar schedule and then they would realize that maybe they all came up from Corvallis together or or something something like that. So I think the community is something that's very underappreciated in a lot of the formalized healthcare. Well, see, healthcare I didn't have a support group. That's just what I was complaining to my physician about. I'm with Providence. Right, so Providence has the monthly yes, support yeah, group. That's, it's not my own specific, but it's... I'm the only Kaiser patient. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, you know, you have to, you have to... Oops, time to go. <laughs> <laughs>